Jennifer Finney Boylan is the author of 13 books, including She's Not There, which was the first best-selling book by a transgender American. A professor of English at Colby College, she has spoken around the country on issues of gender and civil rights at venues and schools, including Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Amherst, Wesleyan, Middlebury, Bowdoin, Columbia, Vanderbilt, Duke, and the National Press Club. She serves on the Board of Trustees and is the national co-chair of GLAD, the nonprofit organization that advocates, for, that advocates for LGBT equality in the media. Professor Boylan is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, and I should add, she wrote an article which ran in yesterday's New York Times, Sunday, New York Times. It's kind of a big deal. So check it out, Google it. And her work has also appeared in the Washington Post, Slate, Salon, and the Huffington Post. She's a frequent guest on national television talk shows, having appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show four times. <laughs> and is the subject of documentaries on the History Channel and CBS News' 48 Hours. She lives in Belgrade Lakes with her wife of 25 years, Deirdre Grace, and her two sons, Sean and Zach, and their two black Labrador retrievers, Indigo and Ranger. And she is here with us today to discuss her book, She's Not There. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Finney Boylan. Hello. How are you? And good afternoon. It's, it's delightful to see you all. And um, thank you for the work that you do to make the lives of our students better. Um, I've been at Colby College for 25 years. We have a first year book program and it really does open eyes. So thank you. I'm grateful to what you do. Uh, I'm also grateful for these incredibly talented authors with whom I'm sharing this, this podium. Colin, Sherry, Sampson, and David. Um, there's a lot of talent up here and it's, very, it's humbling to be, um, to be with you. So thank you for, for your words. Um, you know, I've been, doing this, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, whenever I give readings, I often think back to this event that I gave uh, at Martha's Vineyard some years ago. Um, some of you know Martha's Vineyard is, is pretty small. There's only two, two bookstores on Martha's Vineyard. And um, I, I, I appeared at, at an event uh, at, at 4 o'clock, beautiful summer day. So I showed up there, and there was the manager of the bookstore with this long face, and I said, what? She said, Jenny, wouldn't you know, at the last second, someone has scheduled an event at the other bookstore. So, of course, I thought, you know, who'd go to that when they could come see me? <laughs> and she said, well, it's Hillary Clinton. <laughs> which, which made me think that the only people who would come to my event would be Republicans. <laughs> and uh, transsexuals. <laughs> And in some cases, transsexual Republicans. <laughs> which, of course, uh, raised the question of what is a transsexual Republican? And the answer, someone who thinks a little too much about their private sector. <laughs> Thank you, San Diego, and good night. <laughs> All right, no, okay, wait, I'm back. And now I have to ask, can I put my thing on this thing, or am I going to like start f moving forward through all the, all the slides? Because that could send us into space. Okay, that's good. All right. I don't want, well, actually, going to space, you know, could be interesting. All that, you know, anti-gravity stuff. Anyway, so She's Not There is, uh, has enjoyed a long life as um, a book. It's been, uh, it has been a first-year read at many colleges. Uh, it's uh, found a life among book clubs. And some of its readers are transgender people, that's true, but the vast majority of its readers, I think, are not people who are particularly concerned with the question of how to change gender. Uh, if that's not a question that's been worrying you, you can probably cross it off your list of stuff to, to worry about because it's probably not going to come up from here on out. But you readers, and particularly our students, do have a question which continually comes back to them, which is, how do I live an authentic life? It's, I think it's foremost uh, in the hearts of our first-year students. Who am I going to be? That's part of what they've come to college to find out, the answer to that question. Who am I going to be? And what stands between me and the person whom I need to become? 
what would be the dragon that I have to slay? And so if it's, if it's not the dragon of, of gender, it is the dragon of something else. And what I hope she's not there uh, tells the story of is the story of someone who found the courage to become herself uh, against all odds and uh, someone who uh, found her identity um, even though other people thought it was unseemly. So um, I'm going to read you a short little piece from She's Not There. This is a piece that from, uh, the, uh, from the book that was rewritten as a standalone short, short chapter in the anthology uh, entitled It Gets Better. It came out four or five years ago. Some of you are, some of you are probably familiar with that book. I don't think it's a, it's a Random House book. Is it? Okay, so actually, so I don't think it's available anymore. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was created in response to the um, wave of LGBT, LGBT suicides among young people in uh, 2010 and 2011. And so here's a, it, the, the idea of the anthology was to send the message to young people that um, life will get better. And so this is my contribution, uh, and it's called In the Early Morning Rain. <clears throat> when I was young, there was a time when I thought, the hell with it. I'd never even said the word transgender out loud. I couldn't imagine saying it. I mean, come on, please. So instead, one day, a few years after I got out of college, I loaded up the Volkswagen and I started driving. I wasn't sure where I was going, but I knew I wanted to get away from the Maryland spring with its cherry blossoms and its bursting tulips and all its bullshit. I figured I'd keep driving farther and farther north until there weren't any people. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I was certain that something would occur to me that would end this transgender business once and for all. And so, I set my sights on Nova Scotia. I drove to Maine and took a ferry out of Bar Harbor. I drove onto the SS Blue Nose and stood on the deck and watched America sail away behind me, which as far as I was concerned, was just fine. There was someone walking around in a rabbit costume on the ship. He'd pose with you, and then they'd snap your picture, and an hour or so later, you could purchase the picture of yourself with the rabbit as a memento of your trip to Nova Scotia. I purchased mine. It showed a sad-looking boy, I, I think that's a boy, with long hair reading a book of poetry as a moth-eaten rabbit bends over him. In Nova Scotia, I drove the car east and north for a few days. When dusk came, I'd eat in a diner, and then I'd sleep either in the car or in a small tent I had in the back. There were scattered patches of snow up there, even in May. I kept going north until I got to Cape Breton, which is about as far away as you can get from Baltimore and still be on dry land. In Cape Breton, I hiked around the cliffs, looked at the ocean, at night, I lay in my sleeping bag by the sea as breezes shook the tent. I wrote in my journal, or read the poetry of Robert Frost, or grazed around in the modern libraries, great tales of horror and the supernatural. I read one up there called, O oh, Whistle, and I'll Come to You, My Lad. In the car, I listened to the warlocks sing in the early morning rain. which is a song that goes like this. In the early morning rain With a dollar in my hand And an aching in my heart And my pockets full of sand I'm a long way from home And I miss my loved one so in the early morning rain With no place to go I thought about this girl I knew, Grace. I thought about my parents. I thought about the clear, inescapable fact that I was female in spirit and how, in order to be whole, I'd have to give up on every dream I'd ever had except one. I stayed in a motel one night that was officially closed for the season, but which the operator let me stay in for half price. I opened my suitcase and put on my bra and some jeans and a blue knit top. I combed my hair out and looked in the mirror and saw a perfectly normal looking young woman. This is so wrong, I said to myself, this is the cause of all the trouble. 
I thought about settling in one of the little villages around there, just starting life over as a woman. I could tell everyone I was Canadian. <laughs> then I lay on my back and sobbed. Nobody would ever believe I was Canadian. The next morning, I climbed a mountain at the far northern edge of Cape Breton Island. I climbed up to the top, trying to clear my head, but it wouldn't clear. I kept going up and up past the tree line, past the shrub line, until at last there was just moss. And there I stood, looking out at the cold ocean a thousand miles below me, totally cut off from the world. A fierce wind blew in from the Atlantic. I leaned into it. I saw the waves crashing against the cliff below. I stood right at the edge. My heart pounded. I leaned over the edge of the precipice, but the gale blowing into my body kept me from falling. When the wind died down, I'd start to fall, then it would blow me back up again. I played a little game with the wind, leaning a little further over the edge each time. And then I leaned off the edge of the cliff at a sharp angle, my arms held outward like wings, my body sustained only by the fierce wind, and I thought, well... Is this what you came here to do? Shall we do it then? And then, a huge blast of wind just blew me backward and I, looked, I landed on the moss. It was soft. I stared straight up at the blue sky and I felt something. Are you all right? said the voice. You're going to be okay. You're going to be all right. Looking back now, I'm still not sure whose voice that was. My guardian angel? The ghost of my father? I don't know. But does it really change things all that much to give a name to the spirits that are watching out for us? Still, from this vantage point, over 25 years later, my heart tells me, that was the voice of my future self, the woman I eventually became, a woman who, all these years later, looks more or less like the one I saw in the mirror in the motel. Looking back on that sad, desperate young man, I want to tell him, it will get better. It will not always hurt the way it hurts now. The thing that right now you feel is your greatest curse will someday, against all odds, turn out to be your greatest gift. It's hard to be gay or lesbian. To be trans can be even harder. There have been many times I've lost hope. But in the years since I heard that voice saying, are you all right? You're going to be okay. I found, to my surprise, most people have treated me with love. Some of the people I most expected to lose when I came out as trans turned out to be loving and compassionate and kind. I can't tell you how to get here from there. You have to figure that out for yourself. But I do know that instead of going off that cliff, I walked back down the mountain that morning and instead began the long, long journey toward home. Thanks very much.